Welcome to The Great Composers. This month we're looking at the life and music of Frédéric Chopin and I'm delighted to have been joined by one of our most distinguished pianists, Stephen Huff. Hello, Stephen. Hello, um, Jerry. I think we ought to start, just let's get the period right, the dates, 1810, 1849, tragically short life, um, the epitome of, we think, the romantic composer, mm. dying young, consumption and all that. I don't know whether that's quite the whole story, though. I don't think it is. In fact, I think it's a very misleading side um, of Chopin to think from that out, if you like, because I think Chopin's classicism, certainly from his own view of his own art, is perhaps even more important than his romanticism. We get this idea of an artist dying and somehow the suffering is what it's all about. I mean, there, there is an element of that, but I think... Chopin's control of form is, is absolutely essential to who he is. And for me, it's actually the tension between his classicism and his romanticism that makes him the poignant, incredible, creative artist that he was. You listen to his music and uh, you remember that his early idols, well, indeed all through his life, were the great masters, were Bach and Mozart and indeed yeah. Haydn. Yeah, absolutely. And although in the, in the sonatas, perhaps, you don't see him as the great structural genius that, that Beethoven was, for instance, I think what's fascinating is when he, he's given his own little bit of freedom, a little bit of extra leash, he then comes up with forms such as the ballads, I think, are a perfect example, of works that structurally are as strong as anything ever written in the 19th century. I mean, these are pieces that, that sort of play with sonata form. They take the, the basic bone structure of it and, um, and they take it in a totally romantic direction direction. So, for me, it is this tension between the two that makes Chopin so important. And, and also, it, he didn't write for many different forms, but within that, I don't know anyone who's actually more creative. Yes, it Even is. Beethoven actually kind of wrote the same movement more than once, and certainly Mozart did. Um, but with Chopin, it, the, the creativity to me is absolutely staggering. Well, of course, a lot of people think of him as a lesser composer purely because of uh, his lack of range and the fact that he is, I think, almost the only great composer uh, who didn't write a symphony, who didn't write an opera, who wrote no uh, choral works, uh, and only, I think, one kind of religious work for a, for a friend's wedding, which mm. never got published. You know, It was yeah. all so concentrated on the piano mm. and, and, and chamber music, and that, in some people, eyes takes away from his uh, from him from the pantheon well it's interesting is it most of, of the great composers have lesser works and many of them try things that don't yes, work whether it's right. you know various people having a go i mean what one might even say that beethoven and opera didn't quite work although there's nothing wrong with fidelio but still the, it, there's a sense in which chopin knew what he could do and not only stuck to doing it, but did it to such a degree of, of perfection that I think he transcends all of these rules that we make up about what great art should be. And particularly with the miniature, I know that we're going to be hearing the fourth prelude of Chopin from the Opus 28 set. Um, that piece has more in its two minutes than many symphonies and many operas indeed. And so in that sense, it's almost a 20th century aesthetic. We're almost looking at a Webern way of looking at things, where something is so concentrated that it takes on its own greatness beyond the sense of time. Why does something have to last half an hour to be great? Can it not be great if it actually does the same thing in two minutes? Let's hear Alfred Corto playing the E minor prelude.
Alfred Corto there in the E minor prelude, number four of the 24 preludes, recorded in 1933. Why Corto, Stephen? Well, I think he's... I mean, let's talk a little bit about Chopin's style, shall we? Well, as we've just heard that extraordinary performance, um, if that piece already contains a world within it, Corto's performance of it maybe stretches that world even more. Um, it's, it's so extreme and such an enormous canvas of such a, a, a small piece that I think if he'd only recorded that track, he would have been one of the greatest pianists of all time. Um, for me, he, he's the most revelatory when I was a young um, student playing. I heard Corto and I felt like doors were opening, a little bit like being in a, an 18th century room with a secret panel and you think it's a small room, someone presses a button and suddenly it's a ballroom because a, a, a cabinet has opened out to this huge expanse. Um, I think that Corto has the the French sensibility, which is for me so important in Chopin. He's a typical exile. He left the country. He yearned for it. But if you'd given him a ticket back, he would have given it back to you. He liked being in Paris. <laughs> he didn't want to go back to Warsaw. And I think that's another tension yes, there. Yes, that's right. He leaves Warsaw. He's a famous, um, celebrated young talent and pianist there. In Paris, he, he has a much rockier ride. There are better performers around than him. Maybe not better pianists, we don't know. But suddenly he exchanges this life um, on the concert platform for the life of the salon. And in fact, not even that much in the salon. He, he didn't like playing in public very much, it seems. And this, this change, leaving Warsaw, going to, well, via um, Vienna and Germany, going to Paris, um, is a big change in the way he looks at, at his, his art. His music suddenly becomes very different, very serious, and he suddenly becomes a mature artist almost overnight. Anatole Kittane, Russian pianist, recorded in 1938, playing Chopin's Rondo in E-flat, Opus 16. And I think it's very interesting that he's going back to the land, of course, of his father rather than of his mother. Indeed. But let's go, go back to those beginnings, because one of the reasons why I think he is such a revolutionary, and he is that, I think, as far as the uh, composer for the piano is concerned, is because of the lack of conservatoire formal uh, edu uh, musical education, because he's t he really only had two teachers, and they were not very distinguished teachers at that, mm. um, uh, Elsner and, um, and, and this man called Adelbert Zvini, is it? I think that's how you pronounce it. Who was this um, uh, rather sort of elderly, tobacco-stained, uh, eccentric Czech mm. uh, pianist who claimed to have studied with Johann Sebastian Bach? <laughs> and, uh, but that both of the, by good fortune, both of them saw um, this little Polish genius and doing his own thing and breaking all the rules and allowing him to do that. And it seems yep. to me that that was a tremendous advantage, uh, to, be able to, to be able to learn your Bach and your Haydn and all your, big, your basic technique, but to express yourself freely without being told, no, you must do this, you must do that, this counterpoint is wrong and this parallel fifth here, or whatever the rules are, yep. he was allowed to develop. And so, as you say, by the time he left Warsaw for good, when he was, what, 20 ba barely 20, barely yep. 20, he had this already this fully formed style, which mm. he seemed to have acquired very 
really very quickly. You recognise that individual voice very quickly after he's left uh, Warsaw. Yes, well, the Op- Opus 10 etudes were, were written in those very sort of transitional years. And, yes. and those, to me, are one of the greatest moments in, in Western musical history because, in a sense, they I mean, they, they come from somewhere. You see certain Well, I was going to say they, they, they... What were they written in about early 1830s? Yeah. The first set were written. What is interesting is that um, and I wonder how much he knew of other sets of studies which are already being published, because Moscheles's Opus mm-hmm. 70 studies, which go through all the major yeah. and minor keys, were published in 1827. Yes. And so there was obviously a sort of, um, uh, not a sort of messianic um, <laughs> feel in the air to these. But I think the idea was probably planted. Well, I think there were lots of ideas planted. Obviously, Hummel was an enormous influence. Hummel. And on all of those brilliant style composers in that yeah. post-Beethoven period, one has Kramer and Moscheles and Hertz and Kalkbrenner. And indeed, he played music by these composers. Um, but of course, he, he didn't leave it there. And there are almost no works where he just copies those composers. Every one, he's pushing them forward. And it's always harmony. Yes. Harmony is the thing that fascinates Chopin and also a certain amount of melody. He, he, he found this sentimental sap at the, at the centre of the, the branch somehow of, 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 of the melodies, which became totally his own. Yes, and you listen to all these contemporaries you mentioned and none of them have got that no. melodic gift somehow. That's what no. that separates the men from the boys in this instance, I think. Yeah. But when you say that he's it's the harmonies, and they certainly were challenging to some of his listeners, mm. not to us now, but to, to, to some of these contemporaries, what do you, exactly do you mean by the harmonies? What sort of things was he doing? Can you specify some some particular examples? Yes, yeah. well, I mean, he was he was taking... I mean, most people uh, that we were talking about who wrote etudes, um, they follow very conventional um, harmonic patterns, which are the sort of, you know, beginning with the tonic and doing various things and returning to the tonic. And it's the various things part. Chopin begins with the tonic and ends with the tonic. It's how far away you can wander from the tonic. Yes. And get back there. <laughs> now, this is something, of course, that Schubert was also doing, but in a different kind of way. Schubert would do it in an al- almost absent-minded way. I think Brendel has spoken about sleepwalking. In, in the way Schubert's harmonies suddenly just shift and, and there's no preparation whatsoever. Chopin doesn't do that so much, but he loves to take the possible implications of a harmony and then an enriched harmony and then, well, where will that take me? And then, oh, well, that goes here. And then if I do that, then I can do... And before you know it, you're, you're twisting around. And he, he's not just doing it structurally, but he's doing it coloristically. And this is another way, I think, in which Chopin is a prophet is that he's already looking into what we call impressionistic harmony, in, in non-functional harmony, harmony just for the colour of it, uh, without any particular structural significance. And, and in it, fact, he makes a structure out of it. This is the, the final twist in the tale. It's a paradox. Um, and, of course, you, you listen to this music, which f- seems to flow out like a fountain, it's so natural, but then you look at the manuscripts mm. and you see that he struggles as much as... Beethoven, perhaps, to with frustration to, to get these ideas and cross it out. No, that's not right. I go back, and then he. Yeah. There are there many stories of him sort of walking around the room, throwing the pen <laughs> in the, throwing the paper in the bin, starting. You yeah. know, the, the the typical artist frustrated with how to express yeah. himself on paper, and that when it comes out and it's all been refined and it's beautifully, well, not terribly tidily in Chopin's case, but on, on, right. the, on, on, the, on the paper, uh, it looks as though it's just come out like a, just a natural like turning of the tap on. You know? Yeah, and it's I think also it's, um, that's a, another way in which he's not the typical dishevelled romantic hero because he's such a craftsman. He's such a fussy man at his desk. And, and this is, it reminded me very much of how Britain used to work. You know, Britain was actually a very disciplined man and he would get to his desk in the morning and, and start working. And I think there's something of that in Chopin. And, and again, that's a contradiction to this idea that the artist is someone who stays up all night and, ha- and has opium-induced in- trances. <laughs> no, you can't do the work that Chopin did without a certain sort of mental discipline. I think that's, I think that's very good. And, of course, then you, you, get, you look at the man himself, and he is very much like that, very particular, very fussy about his clothes. I mean, mm. a, a real dandy and bought the most expensive clothes, uh, gloves and hats and... Uh, yeah. Best tailors in Paris, although he couldn't afford it all the time, um, and very, yes, very precise. And that, I think, is also another clue to Chopin 
the man, which isn't always um, talked about, is his relationships with other people. And um, I think I get the impression that he found close emotional relationships with other people, with women, mm. very difficult, very messy. And it, it's extraordinary to think that um, he had, um, he is said to have been in love with this singer in um, in Warsaw, Constanza Gladowska, although he was too shy to express his feelings to her. Then there was, um, I think, a one-night stand in Vienna where he got a nasty disease, and um, so he left women alone a bit for after that. Then there was apparently a fling with the great Delfina Potoka, mm. whom he dedicated a couple of works to, yeah. uh, but we don't know about that. Then he tried to get engaged to uh, Maria Paczynska, who... Uh, we think he was in love with, but he didn't really pursue her with any kind of hot-blooded lust. And then, of course, there is the great affair with a woman dressed as a man, mm. Georges Sand. Um, and, and that, again, was, a, let us say, a strange relationship. So here's a man who finds that sort of relationship, unlike his friend List, mm. who, of course, was pursuing everything in skirts with, with great enthusiasm. Until he put one on himself as an abbe. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, you know, List, List was... Uh, was um, no, we're going to... Straying into very interesting... Change. But the, the point is, all his intimate, close, passionate re uh, relationship... And so I wonder, is it true or is it a cliché that it's all gone into the music... Well, certainly some of it has. There's no question about that. Um, there's almost a Proustian aspect to Chopin of this kind of hot apartment. I can't ever see his music as open-air music. It's very oh, that's much good. the music of, well, the salon, yes, but the, creator, the creation of it is in this, the, an apartment where the windows won't open, really. What's also interesting about Chopin, I think, as against not being the romantic hero, is he seems not to have had much interest in the other arts, from what we can tell. No inspiration from literature or paintings. or And so in that sense, he can't be described as a romantic. No. So he, he is sort of very much the opposite of Liszt, isn't he, in Indeed. so many ways. Yes. In, in Liszt's love of the audience and, and desire for the concert hall. And yet both of them pushed the, the, the craft and, and the writing for the piano forward, um, you know, in, in extraordinary in ways, ways but, but in a very different direction. Let's go back to the studies that you were talking about earlier, because I know there's one particular one and one particular recording you want us to hear. Yes, this is Ignaz Friedman playing the, the, the study, the Etude Opus 10, number 7 in C major. Um, the few reasons I chose this. One is I think it's one of the greatest recordings of a Chopin etude ever made. Um, two is because it's from that first set, which is him developing his voice. There's, there had never been an etude written like this before. How do you take this rather unusual figuration, which I think really comes from Moscheles, I think there's one very similar in that Opus 70 set, and yet make something which is just like an outpouring of lyricism. The other thing is pianos, because Chopin liked the Pleyel piano and didn't particularly like the Erard, which had a heavier, which was Liszt's um, preferred piano at the, at the time. I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing, and, and there's a whole talk to be given on the relationship of, of actions of pianos to interpretations, interpretations of Chopin, not just in the speed, but in the way you actually play a cantabile line. On a modern Steinway, there's a kind of vertical thing that you simply have to do muscularly to get the note down. Whereas on a very light action piano, you can float a line um, in a very horizontal kind of way. And this makes sense, therefore, of, this, of the tempo that one would take um, for something like the D-flat Nocturne, uh, uh, Opus 27, which is close to twice the speed that a lot of people would play now, is it really? the metronome mark. And you think that's mainly because the, the, the those pianos had a, a, sh a shallower action, a lighter action? You could float a lot. I can sort of hear how that would have sounded. Yes. And I see the metronome mark, I see the figuration, the filigree, and and the piano, and I can put a picture together, I think, of, of, of something that he does. And it is not what's become, if you like, the Russian approach, which is slow, rich, deep cantabile. That's not the sound. And, and I think you hear something in the Friedman, in fact, of all the recordings we've chosen, and the, and the Joseph Hoffman to come later is, a, is an example of this too, of this 
way of playing that's directly related to um, the bel canto singing, to the coloratura, to to this way which which a melody takes flight. That takes consummate pianism, and I I don't know any recording that comes close to this. So Chopin's study in C major, Opus 10, number 7, played by Ignaz Friedman in 1926. I'd like to now listen to your Chopin play. You haven't recorded a great deal. No, no, I've played more than I've recorded, and I, I certainly would like to record some more. But um, you've chosen a particular performance of yours which deserves comment, I think. Well, first of all, <laughs> I've chosen a mazurka, yes. and the mazurkas uh, span the whole of Chopin's life, from the, some of his earliest pieces that we have to the very last piece we're told that he wrote. Um, and they have this extraordinary yearning for the homeland. Um, they, they seem to me to have been his sketch pad in one sense, that he, he did a lot of his experiments in them harmonically that then go, he goes on to work on in other pieces. Um, you see something of this. You see something of the minimalism that was something that Chopin came to. Uh, this particular performance, um, it was taken from a live concert um, just outside of Chicago. This is now almost 20 years ago, 1988. Uh, it's the only mazurka I have uh, um, on tape of myself playing. And... Um, I, because it's um, it's something that I would like to record commercially at some point but haven't, I thought it was nice perhaps to have it on here rather than commercially available recordings. I've recorded the four ballads and four scherzos, which um, are easily accessible and available, but this is not. It's, I'm the only one who has a copy, so Let's have a listen. here it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, there we are, my guest Stephen Huff playing Chopin's B minor mazurka, opus 33, number four, with much coughing and a woodpecker in the background, but um, the extraordinary freedom you, you, you bring to that. Well, I think this is a, another example, this piece, of, of, you know, never mind that he couldn't write operas. This piece is an opera. It's, it's a whole world in the most perfect little... Fabergé egg. <laughs> and he was, of course, one of the great improvisers. And I think that's probably where he got a lot of his material from. Chopin is, always has been, an essential part of the pianist's repertoire. It's music which has never gone out of fashion, perhaps like Liszt's has come and gone. Mm. Um, and uh, there are very few pianists, very few pianists, who don't include him in their repertoire. Yes. And again, one of the few composers that we could, you could say that of, I think. That's true. It's it's interesting. I think it appeals to people, it appeals to pianists because it's so gorgeously written for the instrument. Uh, there isn't a bar in Chopin that doesn't lie under the hand, however challenging that might be. Um, it fits the instrument, it fits the sound of the instrument. He, he knows how to space chords so perfectly. Um, you know, you might think in some of the nocturnes that this is just an accompaniment going on underneath. Every note is so carefully judged, and, and if it were an octave lower or higher or in a different spacing, it wouldn't sound as good. So this is something. And I think also that, and maybe it's not easy to analyse this, he just reaches out and touches the heart in a way that perhaps we can't quite grasp which is a pretty good cue to our last piece of Chopin playing, uh, and, and played by, I think, uh, a pianist we both agree is one of the greatest in history, um, playing the a, a late work, um, the Berceurs, Opus 57, um, and it's played, a live recording, in 1937 at the Jubilee concert of Joseph Hoffman. Now, why this particular performance? Because it's because it, it's very different to what you'd expect, isn't it's, it? It's it's very <laughs> shocking. And again, as we were saying, every pianist is is an individual, and this is not how Chopin would have played it necessarily. But I do think that the tempo that Hoffman takes, which if you've not heard this before, you might fall off your seat, is closer to the tempo markings he gives us for the nocturnes, which, of course, is a similar style to this in many ways, and this kind of weaving of the line of doing everything with colour, of having this infinite variety of, of nuance in between the notes and in the inner voices and so on, is, is much more what I think is, is a genuine Chopin style than, than performances perhaps of this piece, which are half the tempo, and um, which are a little bit more um, rocking baby to sleep. In some ways, it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek choice but i think it's an indication of, of something um in in the different styles of chopin that that um, we should be aware of
Well, there we are. That's certainly different. The Berceuse, played by Joseph Hoffman, with those insistent um, dominance he he finds in the in the in the final bars, uh, which you, nobody else I've heard brings out. Very very uh, original that. But recorded in 1937 at his uh, Golden Jubilee concert, and that's all, alas, that we have got time for. I'd just like to thank you very much, Stephen, for taking the time to talk about well the essential Chopin and an essential composer for any pianist.